now they exactly say this town, Hialeah. Hialeah. Hialeah, Florida. It was actually part of Miami, right? And it's only a four-year-old case. That might be almost the youngest one we've done. Well, you know, a lot of people think that a cold case has to be something that's, you know, 20 to 30 years old. And we all know it just simply means when all leads are exhausted. On March 17, 2011, two women passing through an alley in Hialeah, Florida, came upon the body of Norman West. He had been shot twice in the head. Norman West was a young man in his early 30s, just minding his own business, not a harmful person whatsoever. Norman had a big family. He was a son, a brother, and an uncle. He was a little down on his luck, but he was just starting to get back on his feet when he was killed. The crime scene doesn't help us much. No, it doesn't because we don't really have a crime scene. We just simply have an alleyway where his body was basically just thrown out. The trash. Yeah. Norman's killer left little forensic evidence behind at the dump site. But police might have caught their car on camera. The other thing is that one of our suspects is an ex-Miami cop himself. Now that could be where some of our challenges come in. Nobody deserves to be thrown away like that. Whoever did this must have... It doesn't feel like January, does it? No. It's my kind of place. Hi. Hi. Alex Castaneda. Nice to meet you. Hi, Hori. Nice, nice to meet you. meet you. How big is Hialeah? Uh, Area-wise, it's probably about, what, 25 square miles? Around. Hialeah is pretty much a blue-collar city. It's a busy city as far as crime, and they get anywhere in average between 10 and, and 20 homicides a year. You've been working on the case since the beginning. Yes, ma'am. Well, as a homicide detective, you'd, you'd like to solve every case again and bring closure to that individual's family. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Hey, Sir Alex. Detective Castaneda and Detective Garcia, they have done a great job in what I call memorializing this case. They've gone out, they've investigated it to the nth degree. This case is going to be very tough, but I give them kudos for going ahead and doing it. Why don't you tell us about the victim? The name is Norman West. He was basically down on his luck, was homeless for a while. His family took him in. He was living with the sister of his mother. Norman had been out of work, but he was turning things around by taking odd jobs, doing gardening and construction. Everyone you spoke to spoke well of him. Didn't really have any enemies, didn't really have any confrontations with anybody. Norman spent his whole life in Miami. His father was murdered when he was younger, and it's heartbreaking to see that tragic kind of history repeat itself. Walk us through that day when y'all get the call. The date was uh, March 17th, 2011. It was in the mid to late afternoon area and individuals were leaving work and a female and her friend they discovered a lifeless body in the alleyway behind a warehouse oh my God. nobody observed any type of suspicious vehicle or person in the area so units were dispatched out there and when they arrived they locate uh, norman's body he was shot He's down to his uh, white t-shirt and underwear. And it was immediately apparent that it was a homicide. Norman had been shot twice in the head, close contact with a medium caliber weapon. No shell casings or blood spatter were found at the scene, suggesting he was killed somewhere else and then brought to the alley. We pulled surveillance video to see if we could capture what occurred. And we do capture a vehicle. It's a silver colored car. And when the car enters the alleyway, it will make a U-turn. And we basically missed the tag on the vehicle by approximately a foot. So the video doesn't show a body being pushed out or taken out? It goes out of camera frame. Okay. If that car had stopped to dispose of Norman's body just a few yards closer to the camera, this wouldn't be a cold case. But that's why we're here. Okay, y'all want to start working on our suspect board? Sure. Okay, let's start with Larry. That's his cousin? Yeah, Norman's living at his mother's home. On the day that Norman was murdered, Larry Jackson asked Norman to come to his duplex to rake leaves about 4 o'clock. When police questioned neighbors, a witness said he saw a light-colored vehicle pull up to Norman. Norman entered the car and it drove off. At first, the police believed that Larry would be especially helpful to the investigation. Larry Jackson is a uh, retired police officer from the city of Miami Police Department. And we decided to reach out to him to see if he could give us a baseline on, on Norman. So we bring him in and he gives us an alibi that he was at a park with a young lady. Uh, doesn't want to provide the young lady's name out of respect for her because she's married. And did he say that in a way that made you believe it? No, I was, I was a little skeptical. I mean, it's basic information. Okay. Towards the end of the interview, he requests to make the claim on the insurance policy. Larry was carrying a $100,000 life insurance policy on Norman, which is kind of odd, because usually that's the kind of policy you would take out on your spouse or on your parent, not a healthy 33-year-old cousin. 
purchases insurance. When is it? Seven twenty-five ten. That's a hundred grand. Larry is an ex-cop. He's recently retired, and there's no worse suspect you could ever have than a police officer because they know what a prosecutor does to make a case. So you are dealing with the enemy. Come to find out, his niece had also taken out a life insurance policy on Norm. All right, Latarsha. What was her job? She was a sergeant in the Department of Corrections, Florida Department of Corrections. She's Norman's cousin, lived at the same home. I wonder if she resented him living there with Grandma. His aunt? His aunt, her grandma. From speaking to them, they were all bothered that he was there, basically. They consider him as a freeloader. Okay, what else? Has a huge life insurance policy on him. Okay, and she purchased it how long before our murder? About two months and three weeks. Right. Latarsha had her own $200,000 life insurance policy on Norman. But was Norman making the kind of financial contribution to the household to warrant that? Or could there have been something else motivating the policy? How much were her premiums a month? About $400 a month? Don't you think that's kind of significant? $400 a month is that's, a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Neither Latarsha or Larry's policies were paid out after the murder because it's still an open investigation. The question is why were either of them carrying insurance on Norman? And is it possible they were working together to kill him? Who do you want to do? Richard Scott. We're not going to have a picture for him. That's okay. Let's just do it over here. And who is he, Alex? He is Margot's husband. Norman was having an affair with a married woman named Margot Scott, who he was with up until that afternoon of his murder. They were married right when this happened? Yes. Whose money was going to buy Norman clothes and stuff, his or hers? His. Did he say in a statement that he didn't even know about the affair? Do you believe that? If he knew, he kept it under wraps, or he didn't want to publicly put it out there. Okay. Okay, but you had to have asked yourself, okay, is he a jealous husband? He was the muscle to a major drug dealer in the north side of Miami. There you go. This case has no DNA, very little physical evidence, and an ex-cop possibly right in the middle of it. Plus, this is a big city with a low-profile victim and a circumstantial case. It's no surprise that this case did go cold, but we're going to try and fix it. There's a lot of good information still here. You did a good job of documenting and preserving a lot of this type of stuff. I think we can do this. Cheryl, you're lying. Hey, Larry, nice to meet you. Great to you. Cheryl is Norman's sister. Thank you for meeting with us. Cheryl has had a lot of tragedy in her life. What we're going through and what we've been going through, I don't want nobody else to go through. Can you tell us about Norman? What was he like? A pain as usual, <laughs> big brothers. <laughs> but he was okay. He played football all through high school. We was always at his games. He would have been 37 or 38. Never been married, never had a chance to get married. Always wanted kids, but unfortunately, they killed that. Him and my mom started me thinking about cosmetology. He was like, you know, you should go to school for it. And I thought about it years later. Norman told you that? Yeah, him and her. But then she got sick, so I stopped. Every time she got sick, I had to stop what I was doing. And I was seeing about her as time went on. Finally, I did. Your mom raised all y'all here? Yeah, she's from New York. Okay. She came down here and met my father, and unfortunately, he was murdered as well. You're a strong lady. Uh, I guess I get it from her. Do you remember back to the day that your mom was first told about what happened to Norman? We were home. I think just sitting around watching movies and talking. And she kept saying she feels sad and gloomy. She said, later, something's not right. It didn't dawn on us. At that point in time, while she kept saying that, they was killing him then. We got a knock on the door. It was Tasha and Larry Mother. And when you say Tasha, you mean Latarsha? Mm hmm Okay, so they came together to your mother's house. Mm hmm To tell us that he has been murdered, he has been found, shot up in higher live. My mom kept crying and crying and said, only if I would have answered that last call. But she was too sick and weak. That last time he called and after that, no more calls from him. Well, Cheryl, we're going to talk to all the people on Alex's list and hope that something new comes up and try and make the case as strong as possible. And we don't want to break your heart. We're going to try our very hardest. You know that. Yeah. Cheryl still wants to believe that this case can be solved, but she's lost a lot of hope. And it's hard to imagine how someone could take all the pain and suffering she has and not feel like she does. Stay safe. I will. And it makes it that much more potentially heartbreaking to open up a case again and get their hopes up, even though you try not to. 
and it kind of scares you because that's what you're doing. Even though you tell them not to get their hopes up, they always do. Here's our duplex. Our victim, Norman West, was last seen alive by a witness who spotted him raking leaves outside of his cousin Larry's duplex. So the leaf raking would have been taking place where? Right, right all in here. Norman is here around 4.30, and the car comes in, and Norman gets in. The witness saw Norman being driven away. The problem is we don't know what happened between that moment and when Norman's body was discovered in the alley about an hour later. But unfortunately, we don't really know where our crime occurred. Mr. West's body was dumped, which is a horrible thing that they would kill him and then just, you know, throw him out like trash in the back alleyway. The alley where he was discovered was located behind a factory building in an industrial part of town located about six miles from the duplex. Hey, lead the way. Maybe this location could tell us something about how Norman was murdered. Norman, the victim, was located in this general area right here. The lack of physical evidence suggests that Norman wasn't shot in the alley, but we can theorize how he was killed based on the trajectory of the gunshot wounds to Norman's skull. Our victim had two gunshot wounds. You've got one into his cheek. And then when he takes that shot, you know, it's kind of like this. Well, now with his head being turned a little bit like that, it's a perfect shot for this back one right here very very close range it sounds like somebody maybe would be sitting in a car next to him the driver of the vehicle could have easily reached over and shot Norman in the passenger seat some of the things to talk about is the fact that he's missing his pants and his shoes and he's taking the pants off because he can worry about blood spatter and I think you really can't remove his pants without removing the shoes so they're not gonna put the shoes back on once you take off the pants it's possible Norman's killer was afraid traces of their DNA could have been found on his clothes in any case, after Norman's killer shot him, they needed to figure out how to dispose of his body. We believe that the vehicle entered this way. Okay. It's traveling up the alley. Police believe the killer's vehicle entered the alley from the street, turned around and headed back out, stopping briefly to drop off Norman's body along the way. It's a theory supported by a pair of surveillance cameras, fixed at the point where the vehicle turned around. Tries to turn around, doesn't have the turn radius, can't make the full turn, then he backs up, goes out of the frame and then starts to head back south through the alley. Where's the camera? Right there. Okay, so it misses part of it. Right. The vehicle had no front license plate. And due to the angle of the security cameras, a blind spot between them and the car's position during its three-point turn, the rear license plate is never clearly visible. Police believe the dumping of Norman's body then happened around the corner and out of view entirely. So if you stop your car, you've got this really big tree right here who's giving a lot of coverage your car is giving you coverage correct you take the body out and just throw That's it wild. down anybody from the street is never going to see what you're doing no it's easy to see why norman's killer chose this alley it allows for a quick getaway and is usually deserted but they made at least one crucial mistake timing it was quitting time so you have a lot of pedestrian traffic we have probably about five six minute window between the vehicle coming into the alley and the first 911 call the killer may have gotten lucky with their license plate but with that surveillance video and the discovery of the body just minutes later, we can construct the timeline for Norman's murder. God, that is such what a close thinking. timing. In order to build up a timeline leading to Norman's murder, we can examine his cell phone records. Any incoming or outgoing calls should tell us who he was in contact with during his final hours. The last phone calls that are received by the victim prior to his pickup. Right before we think the murder happened. Yes. Uh, we trace it back, and those two calls are from the track phone. Well, basically a, uh, you know, pay-as-you-go type phone. Track phone is a brand of prepaid cell phone. Criminals often use prepaid phones, also called burner phones, to commit crimes because they're cheap and difficult to trace, since users don't need to create an account with the phone company. Furthermore, those two calls from that track phone are deleted from the victim's phone, the actual physical phone. It's possible Norman's killer manually deleted the numbers to cover their tracks. Fortunately, it didn't work. On that track phone, we tracked down to a Walmart. Walmart records confirm it was purchased at this time at this register because they have to activate the phone. Cool, okay. So we get the video of that register and we discover the individual who's paying for the phone is Utarsha. At some point during the interview, we actually show her the video because she's in full denial that she bought a phone. Do you remember at any time prior to the murder purchasing a phone? Purchasing a phone? Yeah. No. Purchase that? No. 
When uh, she sees herself, how does she act? Complete, utter shock. You can see her nice. start sweating. And then she confirms the fact that, yes, she purchased a phone, and she comes up with a story of the phone gets lost. Something happened with the phone. The phone got lost or stolen or... The problem for Latarsha is, if you look at the track phone records after she says it was lost, that phone was used to make calls to Latarsha herself and to Norman right before he was murdered. So whoever had this phone after Latarsha supposedly lost it sure was connected to a lot of people in this case. At first she lies about buying it. Right. Then she lies about... How it's lost. Right now we can't say who was using the track phone, but why is she buying a phone when she has her own cell phone? Why so close to the murder? And did she do this alone or with somebody else? When you have a murder, you start with the inner world of the victim. Norman was not married and had no children, but he was having an affair with Margot Scott. So then you ask yourself, does Margot have a boyfriend or a husband who could be jealous and he's the killer? And that's how you get to Richard Scott. Hi, Margo. Thank you for taking the time out. So we need to talk to Margo Scott and ask her all those hard questions to see whether or not he's involved in this murder case. We're revisiting Norman West. I know it's going to open up some old wounds. I've never called him Norman. Junior. Junior. We refer to him as Junior. He was not disliked by anybody. Everybody liked that young man. He, he, he was a little slow, but he was a sweet person. How long were you in a relationship with him? Probably like six months. Your husband find out? No. He had no idea. It wasn't like he knew something and he was like running around here, I'm going to kill this man or I'm going to do something to him or I'm going to threaten him. I ain't never suspected you were on the phone with him all the time. My husband never suspected anything as far as Junior was concerned. You got to understand, my husband had been flat on his back for about three, four months at the time. He had a brain aneurysm. He doesn't remember anything. I can tell him something right now and he still remember, doesn't remember. He has what's called short-term memory loss. If Richard didn't know about the affair and was recovering from an aneurysm, it seems unlikely that he was mentally and physically able to kill Norman and dispose of his body. All right, we're going to go back to March 17th. Norman would do things for the family, like right. his cousin Larry would have him go to a duplex and do, like, you know, side work, like, right the Which is the duplex that he was at that day. Which is where he was headed that day. I dropped him off, and that was the last time I saw him. And you were having a conversation with him, right? he was on right? the phone, yakking like we normally yak. He was walking, he said, I'm headed to the duplex. And then I look at the phone. I said, your cousin calling me. Why is she calling me? That cousin being Tarsha. Tarsha. Okay. So I clicked the line over from him. She was like, oh, I got your money. Uh, you can come get it. I went back to the line, and all I heard was, I'm like, what the heck? And then I'm steady calling. No response. Saturday morning, I called Tasha. I was like, where is Junior? And she was like, yeah, he did. Just like that. She didn't show no kind of like she was upset, no kind of remorse. It was like it wasn't no big deal. I was like, wow. Margot's phone calls to Norman's cell on the day of the murder could be very useful. Whenever a cell phone sends or receives a call, it pings a cell phone tower nearby, even if no one answers. Those pings can tell you the location of the phone. Hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Brian Roberts has been working with our new cell phone expert to analyze the victim and suspect phone data. These maps and charts lay out exactly where the phones were for the people that we are most interested in in this case. The first thing we need to do is establish where Norman's cell phone was that day. All right. We know that at 4.35 p.m., our victim, Norman West's phone, is by the duplex. A witness reported that Norman was at the duplex till at least 4.43 p.m., and shortly after, he was seen getting in a car and being driven away. Norman's body is found at approximately 620, six miles away from where the duplex is at. Next thing we know, his phone is traveled. After it's called in that he's dead? The fact that Norman's phone keeps moving north after he's dead suggests that whoever killed him also took his phone. Norman's phone is found on the shoulder of I-75, 15 miles away from where Norman's body was found. Norman's phone was discovered broken in half and discarded on the side of a highway. The question is, who brought it there? If you take a look here at the bottom, we have Larry Jackson's phone. Between these hours of 4.30 and 5.01, he's over here by the duplex. This tells us that they are in the same area during this period of time. You're putting them together right before we think the murder happened. The phones Which, are together? Yes. Correct. 
But what we see during the time frame that we think that Norman was murdered, Larry's phone drops off. He's either not receiving calls, making calls, or he's just turned it off. Okay, so we don't know where he is. This location right here is where Larry's phone comes back on again. He makes one phone call to Latarsha at 635, 15 minutes after Norman's body is found in the alley. And of all the people in the whole wide world would be calling, he's calling her. Now, here's what's significant. Larry's phone comes back on in the same area that Norman's phone is dumped. This is great because it puts Larry's phone in the same area as Norman's thrown away phone at the same time Larry is trying to claim he has an alibi. And this is when Larry's still saying he's at the park, right? Right. And the park that he's telling you he's at, you know it, and it's not in this area. No, it's not. Wouldn't use the cell tower. No. The park where Larry was claiming to be that afternoon from around 4 to 7 is about 15 miles from the area where Larry's phone was actually making calls. And those calls were made in the same area where Norman's phone was found. This is the one that makes the I was at the park two to three hours a lie. And that's the one you care about the most because this is when the murder happened. Because our victim, Norman West, was having an affair with a married woman named Margot, we had to look at her husband, Richard, as a suspect. But after reviewing all the evidence again, we know that Richard Scott did have an aneurysm right before this murder happened. I feel confident that it would have probably been physically impossible for him to, okay. to carry out that murder. Carlos, you agree? I agree. 100%. Yo, you agree? Yeah. Steve, you agree? I do. All right, so now y'all can focus all your attention on Latarsha and Larry. Hi, how are you, ma'am? I don't know if you remember me from about four years ago. <laughs> is that yes, sir? Okay. Virginia Jackson is not only Norman's aunt, she's Larry's mother and Latarsha's grandmother. She's also the owner of the home Norman was living in at the time of the murder. Did you know that Norman had some life insurance on him? Yes. Well, at first, Larry took it. Uh, he said he was going to take out some of the because of Lama Bahia staying here with me. Uh -huh. He says anything happened to no, I was going to have to be responsible for putting him away. <laughs> it's not uncommon to purchase life insurance to cover funeral costs, but the average funeral costs less than $10,000. Larry and Latarsha together had over $300,000 of coverage on Norman. So where was the rest of that money going to go? Who had the life insurance on Norman? Larry took it out. And who was supposed to get the money if something happened to Norman? Uh, he's supposed to get it if he took it out. <laughs> How about your granddaughter? Would you be surprised if I told you she had a $200,000 life insurance policy on Norm? She never told you, she never talked to you about it, nothing like that. All right, okay, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time. God, you, you couldn't... She didn't even know Latarsha had the life insurance policy. So, Carlos, where are we headed? To a uh, flea market, it's just north of the police station. Flea market open today? They open seven days a week, maybe. We need to figure out whether or not there was any way Norman West was contributing enough to the family income to justify $300,000 in life insurance. Excuse her name is Kelly. Kelly, what's up, baby? According to the insurance application, Norman's employer at that time was Latarsha's father, Cecil Johnson. How was your relationship with Norman? You know, he trying to find his way, you know, good kid. He'll do what you ask him to do. Little peaceful guy. He ain't going to hurt nobody. He was employed with you? Uh, yeah, he... Did a little couple of things for me, yes, sir. Side jobs, yes, sir. Yeah. Whenever you need moving something. this, moving that, yeah. It's not like you had a company and he worked for you with that company, right? No. At that. This is a life insurance application that was filed. They have Mr. Norman West in occupation construction and the employer, Cecil Johnson. I don't know why they would do that, but and his monthly salary was forty eight hundred dollars. So when this was filled that. out. If he made $4,800 a month, that's over $50,000 a right. year. The man ain't got a bank account. He should at least have a bank account if he can't snap all the Right. Is it safe to say that uh, he was not under your... Let your... me ask you a question. Who the f*** that come from? There was a couple people that filed a life, life insurance claims on him. That's bullshit. One of them was your daughter. Okay, that's okay. Still, still bullshit. And the other one was... I understand. And the other one was uh, Larry Jones. Now, that's a yeah. man stupid, but I don't know about that. This one using you was for two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. This, yeah, this one was for two hundred thousand dollars, and this one is your daughter's putting on him. You know. And she uh, didn't give me no money. No, she, get, she, she didn't get no money. Oh, okay. okay. Cecil never knew about a life insurance policy on Norman. Why would anybody have one? 
Norman never made $4,800 a month in his life. He was young and healthy and was not a significant financial contributor to that family. You can see where someone would have had the idea that he was worth more dead than alive. Do you feel like Larry could tell Latarsha to do all this kind of stuff? Would she do that for Larry? Like that? Man, I, look here. I'm going to tell you two things. I don't know right. and yes. Okay. The only people that were in the middle of these big insurance policies were Latarsha and Larry, which makes you wonder, were they working together to take advantage of Norman? And why would Norman ever agree to this insurance coverage in the first place? So this is Latarsha's policy. When you look these over really carefully and you compare the Norman West signature to what we know to be his true signature, you can see they're not the same. So here's the first signature. Look, it's almost like they missed the R. Notice the O and the O. He doesn't, and notice, he loops, the loop is backwards here, too. Yeah, and top. notice the T and the T and the second. He always comes all the way to the bottom to write his second. Same thing down here. They miss the R. Look at the T. And then the last time, so you got four times here where someone is consistently signing his name, but it's consistently different than his real ID signature. In all the cases I've had, I have never come across insurance policies this questionable. It's time for us to track down the two people who stood to profit the most from Norman West's death. So y'all want to make odds he never gets in the car? In our car? Uh-huh. All right, I'll take care of guys. You might have a miracle, Carlos. You might work your charm, and he might. Yeah. <laughs> we have to hit Larry and Latarsha at the same time. Otherwise, they're going to warn each other, and we're going to lose our chance for a clean interview on each of them. We're going to hit Latarsha. She may make a few statements. Who knows? We got her in once. 269. Thank you. Uh, please. Larry's an ex cop, so you know he's no stranger when it comes to guns. And that means that our guys have to be really careful when they walk up on him. Are we talking to Latarsha now? Yeah, well, we're going to go. Go try it, huh? Steve, Alex, and I are headed to Latarsha Johnson. While Kelly, Detective Garcia, and Detective Miguel Suarez are approaching our other suspect, Larry Jackson. Oh, somebody's inside the cell Hello? Sorry, men, you're up. Hi, good morning. We're retouching Norman's murder again. And I uh, was just wondering if you had some time so we could talk to you in the car, maybe ask you some more questions, see if you've heard anything now. She says she's coming, but she's on the phone. I'm not sure what she's doing. She's calling him before she even gets in this car. One more time. Good morning, Mr. Larry Jackson, please. Hello. Hello. We are clearly never going to get Larry to talk. Let's hope that Steve and Yolanda and Alex are having a whole lot better luck with Latarsha. Let's just go over here. Just sit up front. We'll talk in here. Hi, hey, Latarsha. How are you? What was the reason why you took the life insurance out of Norm? My grandmother told me. Your grandmother told you to take? Mm -hmm. And what was the purpose of that for? In case of something happened to him and under the circumstances where he was... I mean, was he providing money to the house? No. No. Did he ever work for your dad? Yes. When you did your insurance policy, do you remember listing that Norman was making $4,800 a month? No, I didn't fill out the paperwork. 
work, I wasn't even there. How does the claim go into the insurance company? Do you say, if Norman got killed, I'm gonna f I want my money, how does that work? You never make a claim? Would you be surprised if I tell you that I have a sworn statement from you on that insurance policy? After you made a claim? No. That didn't happen? May 11th, you go in and give a statement to the insurance company about Norman's death. You tried to collect on the insurance policy. You tried to get it. You just didn't get it. Tosha, what if I were to tell you that a lot of your story has a lot of holes in it? And there's a lot of evidence that disproves a lot of what you're saying right now. What would you say to that? Okay, I don't know why. Do you remember when we spoke about four years ago? First you told me that you don't remember buying the phone. And then I remember we showed you the video when you were purchasing the phone. Mm -hmm. And then you told us that you gave the phone to your boyfriend, right? Mm -hmm. And then you also told us that the phone was lost on a train. Did you ever use that phone? No. You ever get any calls on that phone? No. Is that your number? Is that your number? This lost phone calls you 10 times, calls your grandmother twice, and calls Norman right before he's murdered twice. Must have been found by somebody who knows you and your grandmother and Norman. Do you think a jury's gonna believe that you bought this track phone, it's lost, and then this track phone is used to call Norman, and then Norman's found dead within about an hour of the last phone call? Do you think people are just gonna believe that's a coincidence? It's 10 calls to me from that phone? Yes. What happened, Latarsha? I don't know. Ask yourself one simple question. If you were us with the information that we've given you, who would you look at? Who? What's it going to be, Latarsh? You going to say the truth, or we're just going to sit here? Latarsha, when you have another one of those sleepless nights like you will tonight, Think of your mom, think of your daughter, think of the rest of your life, and think of where you see yourself. This is my name, this is my number. There you go. Thank you for your time. We couldn't get Latarsha to tell us anymore. It's time to go back and evaluate the case where it stands. Okay, so we've talked about circumstantial evidence all week long, and y'all are going to your prosecutors, and we know how most prosecutors feel about circumstantial evidence cases. Circumstantial cases are always difficult, but when you put them in perspective and everybody understands what they really mean, they can be fantastic. Everybody wants that one big thing, the overwhelming DNA or a confession or the weapon with fingerprints on it to the suspect. But you know what one big thing will get you? If you only have one of these, you can break it. This is what's going to happen. There's your case. But y'all, what's beautiful about this case, you got all these little circumstances. You have an insurance policy. Larry takes out a $100,000 insurance policy on a completely healthy man. And then you have Latarsha take out a $200,000 policy in December. You have Cecil saying, I was never his boss. He never made $4,800 a month. This is a life insurance application and the employer, Cecil Johnson. Who the f that come from? And we can see here that Norman's signature looks forged. Someone is consistently signing his name but it's consistently different than his real ID signature. And then you talk about each and every lie as a circumstance. And then you have Latarsha saying, I didn't buy no track phone. Yes, you did, Latarsha. The track phone was the last number to call Norman before his murder, and all those calls have been deleted from Norman's phone. We might not be able to prove who was using that phone, but the evidence sure shows that Latarsha's trying to distance herself from it. Larry says, we went to the park 
No, he didn't. The park that he's telling you he's at, you know it, and it's not in this area. No. And then you add in there the cell phone record. Every single call made that day between the two of them with the times that it happened showed that Norman's phone and Larry's phone were near each other when he was last seen alive and right after he was murdered. Larry's phone comes back on in the same area that Norman's phone is dumped. Sweet. Look at all these little pieces. When you add them all up, no matter what you try to do to them, you can't break them. And that's why you gotta love your case. Someone Norman trusted called him that day. They picked him up in a car, shot him, and then dumped him in an alley like he was a piece of trash. It all makes you wonder if this is just a story of greed gone horribly wrong. So y'all ready to go to the state attorney's office with everything? I think if we have enough circumstantial evidence, that they'll definitely go for this one. That's good. Y'all ready to go sell it? Let's hope they feel the same way we do. Hello, ladies. Hello, Cheryl. We're happy to see you again. Thank you. I'm just tired. It's been a You're long tired. week. Worried about all this? Yeah, I didn't go on to school for two different courses. You got too much going on in your life, baby. Yeah. So this week, we focused on Norman's case, and we feel like the case got stronger and better to the degree that Alex and his supervisor called up the state's attorney's office, and there's going to be a meeting scheduled. Mm -hmm because they're excited to talk about the case because they feel better about mm -hmm. it. They're actually meeting with the most senior prosecutor that handles murder cases. Oh. Wow. What you thinking? So much. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's, so, that's good. It's very good, actually. Yeah. So you're okay to be patient with all this just yeah. a little bit longer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You suffered a lot in your life, and there comes a day and a time where you got to worry about yourself. Don't you think Norman and your mom would be saying, Cheryl, you got to be happy, girl. Yeah. Put your faith in God and pray and be strong and move ahead. Yeah, I'm trying. It's hard, though. <laughs> well, you're almost there. You're almost done with school, and then yeah. that's your whole new beginning. Yeah. New job, new career, new life. Don't worry about all this. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't argue one minute in the courtroom. You can't question one witness. It's out of your control. The only thing in your control is your life and your happiness. And you gotta worry about that. Okay? Yes. All right, baby. Come on. Come on. You've been doing no part. Okay. Thank worry you. about yourself. She deserves every chance in life to try and find some happiness for herself. And it's time for her to put this behind her because there's nothing she can do to control it. Uh, Alex and Carlos will keep fighting the fight, but she needs to move on in her life. 